so that we can ensure you can be heard. So, Graham Burgess, Councillor Burgess first, please. Present. Present, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Benison. Good morning, Chairman. Yes, I am present. Councillor Hughes. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Yes, I am present. Councillor Curl. Morning, Chair and everyone. Yes, I'm present. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Mellor. Morning, Chair. Present. Councillor Philpott, please. Yes, good morning, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Morning, Chairman. Here and present. Thank you. Councillor Thierry. Councillor Thierry? No. Okay, Councillor Todd. Councillor Todd, Martin, no. Okay. Um, do we have Councillor Vaughan? You I certainly do, Chairman. Great, thank you. Perfect. I can see your I can see your photo there. Thanks. <laughs> And Councillor White. Yeah, present, Chairman. And Councillor Withers, I know, is with us. Please yeah, present, present, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just try one more time. If either Councillor Thierry or Councillor Todd is here, please let me know now. OK. I'd also like to welcome Councillor Humby, Deputy Leader and Executive Member for ETE, and Councillor Jonathan Glenn, Chairman of the Policy and Resources Select Committee. Well, thank you, Chairman. Thank and, you, Councillor Humby. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so apologies for absence. We did have apologies from the two committee members, Councillor Stephen Forster and Councillor Roland Dibbs. Um, and thank you, Councillor Vaughan, for attending as a a deputy. We also have two more who are not here, Councillor Thierry and Councillor Todd. Perhaps they'll join during the meeting. So I'll move on to item two, declarations of interest. And I just remind members that if they do have a disclosable pecuniary interest in any item to be discussed today, please declare it at the time that item is discussed. Moving on to item three, minutes. Other meetings of the meeting held on the 1st of July 2020 agreed. If anyone does have any concerns to note, um, please unmute and speak up now. OK, well, in that case, can I ask you all to briefly unmute and say agreed to the minutes? Agreed. 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 Thank you, members. Uh, well, uh, I can't sign the minutes as I usually do because uh, I'm at home and so is Katie, but we'll find a way for me to sign those minutes eventually. Um, moving on, before we come to the deputations, I'm just going to make my chairman's announcements for, from item five, because I do want to highlight the Active Places Summit, which is taking place on Monday week. That's the 19th of October. We do have a very good list of speakers, three speakers who are national experts. And so I do hope all members and indeed all deputies to this committee today will be able to attend on the 19th. Um, you may recall members that the idea of a cycle summit originally arose from our uh, working lunch that we had on cycling issues um, almost two years ago now. And uh, I'm really pleased that we've been able to bring it to fruition. And uh, I think we'll, we'll learn a lot from this summit and uh, it'll be very useful in the context of the local transport plan. And uh, that brings me on to the next item I wanted to announce, which is that there is a plan to have a workshop to look at the local transport plan material. I've had a sneak preview of it. It's really good. And uh, I think a workshop will be very worthwhile. I think you'll all find that useful. And I do, I want to commend Councillor Humby for pushing ahead with this local transport plan. We're living in a world in flux. Everything's changing because of COVID and because of technology and people working from home more, et cetera. So it's a difficult challenge to plan our transport in Hampshire in the context of that. But I think it's a challenge we can meet and I think we have to meet it. And I think the local transport plan is gonna be a really good way for us to harness the opportunities. 
Um, and then the, the only other thing to announce is that voting is going to be done verbally today because Microsoft, for some reason, have messed up the voting system on Microsoft Teams. So if we do need to have any votes, we're going to we're going to ask members individually to abstain, vote against or in favour. Um, so going back then to item four, deputations. Um, so uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome our three deputies. Tim Pickering, Meg Lampard and Councillor Porter. You'll each have maximum of 10 minutes. And if I could ask Tim Pickering from Walk Ride Waterlooville, please, to go first. Um, please, Tim, unmute and uh, proceed. Good afternoon or good morning, Councillor. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present here. It is most appreciated. Um, I understand everything that's going on with the active travel, and I'm looking forward to that summit. Uh, but I will start talking specifically about pop-up cycle lanes uh, and how they relate to active travel. There is no doubt that we are living in difficult times, and the residents of and businesses in Hampshire are fundamentally affected by it. To enable recovery, people still need to get to school, to work, to the shops, to the doctors. And yet our public transport capacity has been cut by approximately 80%. So a bus previously able to hold 56 people can only hold 17. Just this morning, some buses in the southern area were full and a number were left with only a few seats left. How are these people now going to get around predictably? Work, key workers to the supermarkets to help feed us, doctors and nurses to the hospitals to look after us, teachers to get to school and cottages to teach our kids, and the kids themselves need to get there too. This is just a few of the key worker roles, adding in all businesses being run throughout Hampshire still need to contribute towards our recovery. In response to TV19 and the loss of capacity on our buses, we're suddenly seeing a massive uptick in driving license tests and applications. And parents are now driving their kids to school because people don't see that there are safe, viable alternatives. These parents and new drivers will be adding to con existing congestion. Many of Hampshire roads are have been seriously congested for years, as shown time and time again, just listening to the local radio stations in the mornings for the romance updates, with delays having started in July and continued for ever since. A single car, stationary, typically takes up two metres by five metres, and they're getting bigger. Independent of the number of people that are within it, when they start to move, they need significantly more, adding thinking and braking time, meaning you need 23 metres at 30 miles an hour, potentially just for one person to travel. If you add in that a car is parked for approximately 95% of its life, it has to be stored somewhere, and often that is on the public highways, on land owned and maintained out of the public purse, paid for all residents of Hampshire, whether they themselves own a car or drive or not. These are paid through for through council taxes. But there should be a viable, safe alternative for many of these journeys. Despite a significant proportion, somewhere near th a third of all commuting journeys made on Hampshire roads are less than five miles. And for most, it's just not perceived to be safe to cycle on them. With cycling being a significantly more space efficient mode of transport, after all, you can get 10 bikes in the space of one car parking space. Typically, that's 10 customers for one customers for one space of a car. It is a clear way to make better use of the scant congested space on our roads when you consider that we are moving people, not cars. COVID-19 did provide an opportunity to change this. When lockdown started, the roads were almost empty and cycling was encouraged by central government as a way to travel and get exercise. And we had a massive increase in those cycling with the main perception of the danger on our roads removed. We saw families venturing to the parks, to the shops, linking journeys together. Families that have never ridden the three mile trip before because they didn't feel it's safe. We've seen friends who've never shown an interest in cycling, asking for advice on what to buy, where to go, and then riding three to four times a week and loving it. Personally in May, I had six people asking for our assistance in how to cycle to work to see what was possible when normality resumed. My wife, who hasn't ridden a bike for 15 odd years, got a bike and started cycling the three miles to work as a carer, working shifts, including night shifts when it was raining. 
a trip previously driven in a 1.7 litre diesel Zafira. We had an opportunity to give space to council tax paying residents who wanted to continue to be able to make journeys by bike without being scared when, or indeed if, traffic returned to normal. And in some parts of Hampshire, Hampshire County Council proposed using the EATF, Emergency Act of Travel Funding, to enable residents to walk or ride in safety. And the response appears to have been a mixed bag. Some, such as the route to Fairham College, were withdrawn before even implementation. And others, such as those in Basingstoke, implemented for a short time. And then based on the shouting of a loud, sorry, a loud minority, removed. It is worth noting, and this is very key to this, that for every person opposed to changes in their local area, there are typically 6.5 people who support those changes, shown through a recent YouGov poll. I don't know whether you received the presentation pack, or if not, I'll forward it later. This has been removed to the detriment of everyone in society. For some, seeing a brand new road congested straight away is seen as a failure. And yet if we provide a cycle lane or cycle parking, if it's not full straight away, it's seen to be a failure too. This is, just doesn't make sense. And this is in, after a period where in 2019 we saw yet another increase in riders killed or seriously injured on our roads in a continued upward trend. Although, despite being clearly laid out for monitoring as a key performance indicator in the Hampshire County, the Hampshire County Council cycle strategy, by your own admission, you're not. Is it really any surprise that people are scared to ride on our roads, especially because of all of the above? We're now exceeding pre-lockdown levels of motor traffic. My own eight-year-old son was run off the road earlier this week. Sorry. By something, someone thinking that might is right and driving at him when they were overtaking a parked car. We need to break the cycle. Pop-up cycle lanes, pop-up modal filters, space for people to travel are a great way to do that. Hampshire is big. I recognize that. And the Emergency Act of Travel Trance 1 funding and Trance 2 funding are only a drop in the ocean. And I understand that too. But we need to use it effectively. In July this year, the government announced new updated guidance on cycling infrastructure provision alongside their new gear change policy. And I hope that Count Hampshire County Council thoroughly embrace this new guidance rather than doing what they've done in the past diverting a cycle route from the land east of Horndean to the nearest train station, making it eight kilometers long, when the direct route used by those in cars is three. People won't cycle that three kilometer route. They'll be attacked, they'll be abused for doing it. When looking at this new guidance, it is really important to understand that Hampshire County Council failed to meet 29 year old guidance just two weeks ago, which states the painted cycle lane should be two meters wide. Instead, they painted an 80 centimeter wide cycle lane as part of an operation resilience work. It's not acceptable. So while I seriously thank the Hampshire Highways team for stepping up to the challenge of using the EATF funding all of a sudden with all the other things that were going on in their deliveries, especially using tools such as Commonplace to gain direct feedback from residents in an easy and usable manner uh, on what needs to change, and making fundamental changes to the highways such as in Petersfield and Winchester to enable people to move, people to get to businesses, people to do their shopping. I plead with councillors not just to listen to those that scream the loudest, but to actually engage with everyone in their ward from all backgrounds to understand how they benefit their wards. I thank you for your time uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation, Tim. And uh, I can promise you that uh, your presentation will be considered by all of us in our discussion later. Um, and in fact, your first presentation to us a couple of years ago did have quite an impact on this committee and I'm sure this one will too and I'll just confirm we did get your PowerPoint slides I was looking at them while you were talking so thank you for that um, and I'd like to move on now 
pleased to our second deputation from Meg Lampard of Gospel and Fair and Friends of the Earth. Please unmute and proceed, Meg. Good morning, members. Uh, I'll begin by sharing a quote with you uh, about cycling from Josie Drew, a lifelong cyclist and author of The Wind in My Wheels. It's the funnest, fastest and most practical way for me to get around. Like Josie, I've cycled all my life. I grew up cycling freely and independently from around the age of 11 in the lanes around Cornwall, finding new paths and routes as I explored. That experience of freedom has stuck with me. And many years later, now as a parent, it's something that I wish to share with my children. I have three children. When they were small, I used a bike and trailer to transport them. Now they are all big enough to propel themselves. My eldest attends a local secondary school. She chooses to walk to school, a journey of around 40 minutes. Over the lockdown period, parents discuss cycling to make the journey quicker. But uncertainty over establishing a safe route meant that this option has not been realised. Currently, my daughter meets up with her friends and then is given a lift from another parent into school each day. My middle child attends a local primary school. Methods of travelling to and from school have included walking and running, <laughs> skating, scootering, independent cycling on his own bike and cycling together on our tandem. My youngest child is home educated and we travel to and from our educational venues, either on our own bikes or on our tandem. Occasionally, we may need to use the car. In September, we clocked up together 154 miles on our bikes. My interest in active travel and school streets stems from observing the regular journeys that my children make to and from school each day. I know that their experiences now will set the course of their choices later in life. A study published by in the uh, BMJ last April found that regular cycling cuts the risk of death from all causes by more than 40% and cuts the risk of cancer and heart disease by 45%. I'd like my children to be able to make this healthy choice for their life. Plus, an active body leads to an active mind. Those children that arrive under their own steam to school are able to concentrate better in class and achieve more academically. Sadly, children in England are the most overweight in the EU. We also know that regular exercise improves mental well-being physical exercise being something of a wonder drug due to the natural chemicals being released into the brain. Air pollution too is an issue for our children. Up to 25% of rush hour traffic can be due to school drop-offs and pick-ups. Children's long-term health is at risk through reduced lung function and damage to many other organs. A recent report has shown that nanoparticles derived from air pollution has been located in the brain stems of young people, suggesting links to the onset of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Additionally, our children are exposed to worse air pollution inside cars, particularly in the back seat of the car. We need our children out of cars and back on our streets. Finally, I want to share with you some of the local chatter around walking and cycling to and from school that is currently circul circulating in our area. Sarah, on Tuesday the 6th of October at approximately 3.20, my son was knocked from his bike by a plain white van at a pedestrian crossing. The driver got out of his van 
moved my son's bike to the pavement and drove away. Karen. My daughter was knocked off her bike at the exact same crossing two weeks ago. The lights were red, but the woman who hit her said she didn't see it or my daughter as the sun was in her eyes. These very recent examples show some of the incidents of children being hit by drivers whilst crossing our local roads on their journeys to and from school. They show that we are not providing a safe environment that these children need to explore their world independently. Again, here's a letter from my daughter's secondary school, which was received yesterday. It is a pleasure when on duty outside school to see so many of our students cycling safely and with regard for other pedestrians and road users. However, I'm concerned by the number of complaints and concerns I've received this week about dangerous cycling from members of our community. Often these communications are prompted by a real concern for our students and that their behaviour may lead to an injury whilst riding their bikes. We always expect our students to treat other road users and pedestrians with respect and to keep themselves safe on their journey to school. Here's a letter from my child's junior school dated 30th of September. We are increasingly aware of traffic issues and we're aware of a near miss with a child and a parent on their bike. Please think about where you're parking and ensure you are not parked on double yellow lines when dropping children to school. We cannot make children behave like adults on roads because they are children. Instead, we have to make the changes to our travel infrastructure to keep our children safe. Will the children affected in these examples continue to walk and cycle independently or following their experiences and clashes with travel, traffic, will they give up on active travel and go back to being dependent upon their parents to drive them to their destinations and face the worsened health outcomes of rising obesity levels and diabetes to name but a few? Can we alleviate concerns about behaviour on the school route by taking away the dangers posed by cars and drivers? These examples I've given you show how live and relevant this issue is now. Choices being made today, experience out on our roads in around the schools are shaping the choices that our children will make as to whether they will be choosing active travel now and in the future. I want to thank the council and the members of the council for voting uh, for the motion to look more closely at school streets and I'm really looking forward to seeing the effects of the implementation. I want you to help these children by providing the safe infrastructure and I want you to start with school streets. Thank you. Thank you, Meg, for that deputation. And uh, I think it was a, a very powerful deputation. And it chimes with a lot of what we hear when we talk to our residents in our divisions um, and the emails we get from concerned parents um, who are scared to let their kids cycle to school. So, you know, we, we are very alert to these issues and we're going to be debating them today. Um, I'd like to invite Tim and Meg to continue watching this meeting on YouTube. It is our standard Hampshire County Council practice that after deputies have finished, um, they, they leave the Microsoft Teams meeting and then, and then follow progress on YouTube. So uh, I'd like to thank you and invite you to do that. Um, our next deputation is from Councillor Porter, who as a councillor will be welcome to stay after her deputation. Um, so, Jackie, I'd like you now to give your deputation, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for uh, taking the time to discuss how this motion will be taken forward today. I really appreciate it. So far, all the actions that have been taken using the funding have been to accommodate the needs of pedestrian and cyclists in commercial and retail areas. 
Many people started to cycle during lockdown, but actually stopped as the cars took over the roads. And these changes in the retail areas kept cycling and walking on the agenda. But as none has been set up to accommodate the needs of children, that's why we set the motion in place. It's particularly relevant because this week is walking to school week and at my school it's Walktober as it is in many other schools. And a few years ago, I walked a different route with a different child every day to find out what their walking week was like. And most of them, when I asked them, what would you change? They said, we'd like Walktober every month. In fact, it was the May one then. They said they'd like walk to school week every month because it would really help us all to think and our mums and dads to get out of the habit of taking us in the car. Parents now are driving more children to school than ever. In some cases where they weren't before, they're adding to the congestion outside schools and in the roads to them. Meanwhile, Hampshire has a very impressively high percentage of attendance. Uh, at our school, it's about 97%. So we do owe those children a really good start to the school day and an end too. But the children that are getting to school are hampered by the drivers, their air pollution and the congestion they cause. The parents themselves deter active travel of others and the children leave parents stressed in their cars. I know that because when I do the walk to school, uh, the walking bus, often the child gets out, the parents in a state, the child's in a state within two minutes of walking along the road or scootering there or along the, the path. They feel different children. They're different children. Their, their stress is relieved. Their anxiety is relieved. Their, their quality of life has improved within metres. The county has used this period to try and fund experimental schemes in retail areas. And in reality, school entrances are really busy places too. Uh, if only for the four specific times of day when the children go in and out. That's breakfast club, going in at the main time in the morning, in the afternoon when they leave, and again after school club time. I'm urging the county to use their specific powers in the COVID times to look again at how children reach their schools, to monitor the air pollution in these areas that children are exposed to, either walking and cycling. And Meg has just explained to you all about what the health benefits of that are, so I won't do that as well. In my own area, children travelling to Henry Beaufort and Westgate have been let down by buses and parents have resorted to the car because they know it's a certain way of getting them to school. Biking is not an option for those children. The routes are just not available. It's not all bad news. At the school where I'm a governor, there's certainly at Hampshire County Council, probably about five or seven years ago, invested in a path across the park to take children from a car park that's way away from the school and a wide path to the school gate to enable families to get to the school more easily. It's been a great success. Children walk, scoot and cycle and they either walk alone or with parents or they take the walking bus. So it is possible and we do know we can we can achieve it. So schools do have aspirations for active travel and reducing congestion, but they lose the, the heart when school travel plans, they can't see any funds tied up to them and any changes happening quickly or action. So this motion could give the County Council the opportunity to break that circle of highways only being cars only when actually we need to cover the needs of cyclists and walkers to schools as well. In principle, even primary schools have uh, catchment areas that are all within walking distance and we should be encouraging it at every opportunity. As I mentioned at the council meeting, the new Barton Farm School has no clear pedestrian exit entrance that is free from car travel, except along a muddy countryside path. The school transport plan doesn't have to be in place until a year after opening. I was struck by how many people wanted this motion to succeed from right across the county. But passing a motion, I'm afraid, isn't enough. We need to use this COVID-19 period and the funding it's provided to give us the opportunity to make children the changes that the children and their active parents seek. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Um, and uh, you're very welcome to stay on this team's call um, and listen to the debate. I will do. Thank you. OK, let's get on now with the uh, uh, presentations that we're having for our meeting. Item six 
is a COVID-19 update in economy recovery. I'm very grateful to David Fletcher for joining us again to update us. Um, I'd like to ask David to be as, as swift as possible because we've got uh, three presentations to, to do still. Um, and we'll then have a, a discussion. So David, please feel free to share your screen. Um, the slides are on ModGov for anyone who wants to have them on ModGov. And um, uh, over to you, David. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, if you just give me one second, I'm very aware of the um, the time pressures, so I will I will proceed at a fair rate of knots, if that's okay. Um, and then we can take any questions, maybe when I've gone through the, the slides. But just very quickly to say, there are sort of two two halves to this presentation, which will be very clear because the graphic changes. But the first half is the usual update, and then very briefly, I just wanted to touch on a very specific uh, agenda around um, a kind of office workspace and some work we're doing around that. So, but I will dive straight into um, the the initial economic recovery update. Um, first of all, in terms of the data, I, I know you've had sight of this in advance, so maybe some of you have had chance to kind of get your heads around what this is trying to say. Um, basically, what this is tracking um, uh, across Hampshire and Isle of Wight is the, um, and the UK for that matter, but is, is the month on month changes in GDP. And as you can see in March and April, we saw that very significant drop um, in GDP. And then in May, we started to see the very first signs of recovery, a much healthier. Um, uh, dose of recovery in June and slightly subsiding in July. Um, what that gives you overall um, when you get into the July numbers, there's always a time lag with this, this data. That's the one thing that's slightly frustrating. Um, but is we're something between 11 and 12 percent down compared to where we were in um, in February before lockdown and everything kicked in. Um, one of the things, as I say, we, we we do struggle with. I've said this before. Is, is finding live data ways of, manage, of, of uh, monitoring what's happening in the economy. Um, one of the things that's very live is seeing what vacancies are being um, advertised in the local labour market. Um, and this is, so this is one set of data we use as a proxy for what's happening there. And you can see there not only the big difference between 2019 and 2020, uh, but also that, that, that decline as well uh, across that time period across the summer. Um, and then in terms of government data, again, a bit of a time lag, but less than the GDP figures, is what's happening with the unemployment, the claimant count. And then and you'll see somewhere, in, we've, we've tracked here, this is across many years, obviously, and shows previous recessions and the sorts of pattern. The key point to note there is there's always a time lag between the economy recovering and the labour market recovering. And what you'll see here is, is um, there's that line there which says rate 2.1 to 5.2%. So that's where we've seen the claimant count change since February. Um, I think the concern is that that claimant count will, will significantly rise. Um, because 2.1 to 5.2, it is significant. But we think that could even rise further, particularly when we see the likes of the job retention scheme come to an end. Um, and in terms of the job retention scheme and the self-employed income support scheme, um, to the left you can see probably the figures, probably the peak of the number of individuals supported by those two schemes. Clearly the, the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme, much bigger in terms of scale of numbers. Um, the self-employed numbers have already started to drop off, I guess, as businesses have been able to, to move again. Obviously those people are not, are not claiming from that scheme anymore. And, and some interesting stats there in terms of the complete contrast between the different parts of the economy that have had to rely on that furlough scheme uh, to sustain, um, the, the, you know, the, the costs associated with their staff. And you can clearly see that kind of hospitality, leisure, consumer orientated parts of the economy, very dependent. And then, of course, the public sector and, and others sort of much, much, much less, less so. Um, uh, is confidence returning? I think maybe, like all of us, if you'd asked us a month ago, we probably would have said yes without the question mark. I think now, because we've seen the increases in cases again and, and almost the, the measures being 
tweaked now around lockdown, I think we can see that that confidence might be maybe rather more fragile and, and, and maybe the, 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 the challenges associated with the current crisis are going to live with us for much, much longer than we originally anticipated. But we have seen increases in business confidence and business activity. I guess the challenge is, you know, how much is that sustained over the next few months? I think that's going to be really, really critical. And of course, consumer confidence um, is, a, is a key factor as well in, in all of that equation. Um, obviously, the government's announced not a budget, but, a, but an economy plan for the winter. Um, the biggest probably biggest headline is around the job support scheme, which is the sort of, you know, son of job retention scheme. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. And other, other measures extended, uh, the self-employed scheme, the VAT cut for that part of the um, economy around hospitality and tourism, and the business loans payback cut periods being extended from, from six to 10 years. So the government's still trying to do everything it possibly can really within the measures that have already been established to try and uh, take the sting out of the immediate impact on the on the economy. And then in terms of that job support scheme, um, to, to try and to, to make this relatively straightforward, if you assume that someone is working the minimum to, to be part of the scheme, which is a third of their hours, um, what it means is of the 66 point something percent that's left of the hours um, that they're not working, um, the employer has to fund another 22%, so the employer is funding 55%, and the job support scheme would, would support the, the another 22%. So you end up being 22% down in terms of the income, but the scheme itself is only supporting 22% of the total number of hours that that person could work, and obviously it's supporting um, at the, hours that the, the, the hours that are not being worked, not the hours that are being worked, they're funded by the employer. But when you compare that even visually in terms of the furlough scheme, which is supporting up to 80% for the bulk of that scheme, it's not a scheme that's anything like as generous. And there is a real concern. I've just come out of another meeting where one of the LEPs was saying there's a real concern that actually, although there is another scheme there, there will still be a drop off when we, when we move from one scheme to the other in terms of, um, of challenges around um, unemployment rising. Um, and I can go through this at a reasonable pace because we touched on this in the previous presentation, some of the, the priorities for Hampshire. Obviously, there's that continued government support for businesses, which we will continue to ensure businesses are aware of and can tap into. Um, there is quite a bit of um, effort still being put into trying to ensure that the, the domestic tourism market is still uh, being utilised. I guess some of the challenges around uh, international travel almost play into that agenda, which is, which is good. But clearly we're into the time of the year when the weather and everything else is is not as favorable is it for that particular sector um employment and skills absolutely critical the people dimension of the crisis is probably going to become even more significant over the coming months and our colleagues in hampshire futures have been working very hard around schemes like kickstart etc uh, and also still continuing to try and leverage opportunities from the likes of major construction projects, the apprenticeship levy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really, really important. The cruise sector trying desperately to send out positive signals about a restart in 2021. Again, the, the current scenario around the growth of cases and lockdown, et cetera, you know, how that will play into that agenda, we don't know at this stage. Southampton Airport, we've talked about the planning application. Likely now that will be determined in December. Um, and, and local retail continue support for the high streets and a growth around this agenda around e-commerce and how we can help local employ uh, local retailers to actually offer some of the routes to market that national retailers can offer like click and collect. Um, me medium term, we do need to look at the business support landscape. This is obviously a dialogue with government as well. How do we simplify that and make sure there's consistency in that particular landscape for businesses? Innovation support, key part of the Commission of Inquiries findings. We need a, an active innovation ecosystem in Hampshire. How do we continue to, to support businesses which start potentially out of the universities and actually have the potential to be commercialised into profitable and growing businesses? Work hubs and urban centres, etc. I'll come back to that in a second because that's part of the, the, the second half of the presentation. And obviously digital connectivity, massively important anyway. 
probably the current scenario has made that even more so because we're all recognising how we need to build that flexibility into our local economies going forward. And in the long term, the government is, we understand, not too far away now from uh, launching at the competitive process for Freeport status. Um, a lot of discussion around this, but a critical factor, of course, will be whether the Port of Southampton wishes to be part of that, because without their um, participation in a bid for Hampshire, I, I, I think we would struggle to see that as being a compelling bid. Um, obviously, we've got all the major capital projects, not, not all of them public sector led, many private sector led. Fawley Waterside, a good example, getting its outline planning. Those are all going to be key drivers in the longer term in terms of economic recovery. A massive growth in terms of dis discussions around green recovery and what that actually means on the ground. Clearly something that needs to be built into our longer term considerations in terms of, of economic recovery. And the circular economy, not just in terms of local supply chains, but what that means in a totally holistic uh, sense in terms of how do you ensure that, you know, kind of environmental impact, human impact, all those things are taken on board when you're designing your economic strategy for the future. Um, so that was the very quick version of the, the kind of data and where we're at in terms of the recovery in Hampshire. One of the key strands is this, you know, what happens with office workspace. We're all aware the county council is a good example, but there's lots of organisations, public and private sector, that have had to overnight um, change their business operating models, obviously have a far greater proportion of people working from home and probably prove to ourselves how adaptable we actually are as an economy. Um, probably more adaptable than we gave ourselves credit for. And a piece of work we've been looking at with the Enterprise M3 left in particular has been around this particular um, agenda. And just some very quick background. Um, at the moment in the in the UK, probably about 7% of officers are, are let on a flexible to, on flexible basis. And James Lang LaSalle saying that could increase to 30% by 2030. I even suspect by 2030, it might be more than 30%. Um, and this is just a statement from the Welsh Government talking about, actively talking about creating this network of community-based remote working hubs, basically to not only enable staff to have a, a, a greater uh, work-life balance, but also contributing to those agendas around productivity, the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a potential win-win in this type of approach? Um, we've seen a massive increase in that remote working. Look at some of those figures there for the ICT and the professional services sector, huge proportions. Clearly, there are sectors that can deal with that. Some sectors, we've just talked about the impact on hospitality. Clearly, that doesn't work for sectors like that. Um, so some of those short term impacts uh, on our on our environment is, is um, those immediate changes to business operating models, that overnight change in remote working actually been a drop in demand for co-working space because a lot of entrepreneurs and smaller businesses who might have been working in those spaces have just reverted to home working which is probably how they would have operated in the past and that new normal you know will larger occupiers larger office occupiers have to retain space for a period of time partly because if they want to get people back into the office they've got to enable social distancing but also they'll be locked into longer term leases I know one business in Basingstoke is already having to look at how it might sublet some other parts of its existing uh, substantial office space. And then do, are, are we going to see that trend, trend longer term to smaller satellite offices and hubs to enable um, people to work more local to where they live, reduce commute times, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we, we anticipate there will be this growth in demand for flexible workspaces both for occupiers large and small. You know, at one time it would have been more your kind of small startups, growth businesses. We're now seeing a pattern of larger occupiers. Good example, just very briefly, uh, some space at IBM in Hursley, which is now being managed by a, a, an organization called Inkyhive. One of their occupiers there is actually Tesco. It, it's not just small businesses now. Um, um, but, but there is a critical point here around workspaces. They still have this critical role uh, particularly around things like mentoring younger members of staff, uh, ensuring that you still have some kind of strong company culture. I was in a meeting yesterday, a real meeting, I have to say, at Farnborough Airport, where the new chief exec there was saying, if you want to get staff together and really generate lots of new ideas and innovation, 
you kind of have to have them in the room. And, and I do understand what he means. The interaction between people is not the same when it's all online. So some areas of opportunity, we think for Hampshire, some businesses that currently occupy large spaces in London might want to disperse some of that requirement elsewhere and places like Hampshire are well set for that, particularly with our kind of polycentric economy. Um, a lot of companies might have to reconfigure their own major office space. Um, and also, is this something that plays more into the agendas of smaller urban centres, even market towns like we have in Hampshire? An interesting concept. Um, and as I say, these satellite hubs for larger corporates so that you actually put the workspace close to where people live rather than, you know, sort of everyone being in one, in one large headquarters. Of course, there's an agenda here for the public sector, an opportunity. Do we need to start rationalising our own estate and genuinely using this as a catalyst to bring key parts of the public sector into, into single buildings or single hubs? And then, of course, across Hampshire, you've got town centres like Andover and Haven't which, and, and Farmer, which have got ambitious plans for their own regeneration. And actually, we need to make sure we consider this wider agenda around the future of workspace in the design of those regeneration schemes. And I think that's me done. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank David. You, David. I was very I'm glad, very you, glad. You, you ended there on the uh, areas of opportunity, which I think I agree with all of those. Could I ask Chair, if they would like to put a question to David or make a comment? Uh, and whilst you're doing that, I'll just ask David whether he knows about the DCMS broadband funding, because I think getting us up to 100% super fast will be very good for the economy um, in Hampshire. And we are stuck at about 97%. Um, and many of those 97 have unstable, slow broadband connections. I'm aware DCMS got 5 billion from the Treasury. When are we going to find out whether some of that money is going to be spent in Hampshire? Do you have any knowledge of that situation, David? To a, to a degree, I, I think um, what we've probably seen in Hampshire and maybe the same in other places is, is sort of individual proposals uh, coming forward in relation to that agenda. So, for example, in the Enterprise M3 area, there is um, a proposal for a, a fibre spine which would link Basingstoke by a, a deliberately, um, you know, not as the, as the, as the crow flies route um, to Guildford to actually encompass a number of business parks, uh, hospitals, other public sector assets, some rural communities, etc. So one of the means that we're trying to overcome that, that percentage of, of coverage, if you like, issue um, uh, is, is, is through individual schemes like that. There's another one which is being proposed, which Solent Left are supporting, which is around um, for the water side and, and making that 5G enabled um, down the A326, down the water side. And there's another one I'm aware of, which is directly bidding to DCMS and has been shortlisted for that, is, is to actually create a, a 5G enabled area of the Solent, um, at, literally across the, the marine area so that we can actually trial and test marine applications that are 5G enabled. Now, I know that's slightly different to the agenda you've just talked about. The one thing I would say, and this goes back to the latter part of my presentation there, is I think in the past, the economic case, I'm not talking about the community or the social case, but the economic case for investing in rural Hampshire in terms of broadband was probably not as strong as it would be in the urban parts of Hampshire. I think the current scenario, and if those um, changes in um, work practices, business operating models does, does, is fulfilled, then actually suddenly the case is very different because actually what you're saying is if we can enable effective digital connectivity in our rural communities, you genuinely will reduce the need for people to travel great distances to get to their corporate office or what have you. So I think the, the case, if you like, to be made for government for investment in those rural parts of Hampshire suddenly starts to become much more compelling than maybe it was previously. Well, I would agree. And the rural economy is important um, to Hampshire. And we, we, have to, um, we have to find ways to, to increase opportunities for people working from home, but also small businesses operating from remote locations. And I get a lot of emails about that. So um, I hope we do get some more DCMS funding broadband. Um, 
I don't see any hands raised. I think everyone wants to get on to the school streets and the pop-up active travel items. So you've got off lightly today, David. Um, no, that's perfect, and it maybe gets you back roughly on track as well. So yeah, uh, but I'd, I'd like to thank you for a very helpful presentation, and uh, and please keep up the good and important work you're doing. Thank Thanks. you. The only thing I would finish with, Chair, is in relation to that workspace agenda. If, if any members think of any opportunities or locations where they think that agenda is relevant in terms of um, converting existing space in particular for that use, then we'd be very interested because we're, we're trying to gather a, effectively a set of evidence around, um, you know, whether there are some specific opportunities we can use in Hampshire to, to pilot that approach. Okay. And of course, now I'm getting questions, so I, I should have yeah. just said goodbye, should I? Yeah, well, I'll go to Councillor Simpson first then. Unmute, please, David. That's it. Um, thank you, uh, David, for that. You Are you aware that the fire authority is looking at using the retained fire stations, putting in uh, Wi-Fi and doing other things so that retained firefighters can use them in the, nearly all in rural locations, of course? So it would be worth talking to them to see if we can get a cross fertilization of ideas on what Hampshire could do with the fire authority. We already have the partnership where we do back office stuff together. So it may just be worth you talking to them. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. And Councillor Todd, welcome to the meeting. Uh, have you got a question or point to make? Um, yes, I, looking at the uh, future of office workspace, that's obviously an area of um, great interest to districts as well, but and their role as planning authorities, but also I know, and I declare an interest as I'm a cabinet member in Winchester, uh, although not for business, um, also in terms of how they're thinking of regeneration and other such things. And I just wondered what our partnership model was with districts, because they're also obviously very concerned at the moment in terms of, uh, they're also all thinking about economic recovery in their town centres and their village centres and their city centre. Um, and I just wondered what our partnership model of working was and whether that's changed or become more ambitious in response to um, the challenge of COVID. Thank, thank you, Councillor Todd. Yeah, it's interesting in relation to that dialogue with Enterprise M3 Let, as I say, what we're really trying to do is ident identify very specific real opportunities that we can actually, uh, in a sense, pilot or test this, this concept. Um, and and the, the two we've identified so far, which feel very tangible, one is in Andover, unfortunately for me in responding to your question, the other is in Winchester. Um, so we are actually at the moment exploring quite specific opportunities to see if there is both an appetite, not just in terms of operators, because obviously you need somebody who's going to operate the, the space if it's base flex, if it's uh, offered on a flexible basis, but also, of course, you have to look at the financial model if there is capital costs associated with the conversion of that space to make it fit for purpose. So, um, so I, I, you know, because the risk with all these things, isn't it, that they remain strategies or theories, and actually what we ultimately need to do is is, is turn this into some sort of um, reality and, and learn lessons from that. And, the final thing I would say is we're all wrestling with what we do with the future of our town centres, etc. And I, I do think if we can get a number of um, agendas aligned, actually this could be one of the ways in which you start to bring activity back into centres, albeit slightly different from having your big, you know, a, a small number of big occupiers. You might end up with a large number of organisations taking space in a town centre but each space individually is not as big, if that makes sense. It's a very different kind of ecosystem that you could be creating. Thank uh, uh, you. Yeah, sorry, could I, if I could have a quick Yeah, well, I'm keen to move on, but go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, is our vehicle for engaging with the district just via the LEPs, or do we have other more direct methods that we engage with them on these issues? No, no, we, we, no, we, we engage with them directly. I think what I was just trying to make the point is the LEP has offered support for uh, projects we can identify. What we're now doing is working with the districts and boroughs to identify some specific um, opportunities because clearly you can only put funding into real opportunities. 
Um, so that's what we're trying to identify at present. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Councillor Todd. Um, I, I, I will say goodbye now, Chair. But yeah. Thank you. Thank goodbye you. and thanks. And uh, we're going to move on now to item seven, pop-up schemes and active travel. Um, and I'd welcome David Wilson and Nicola Waite, friends to this committee. Um, and I believe you're going to give us your presentation on this issue combined with the presentation on the school street scheme. And we'll, after that, we'll have questions. But please do try and limit your time to, to 10 to 12 minutes for your presentation, please. Um, so, yeah, over to you, David and Nicola. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've, Nicola will take us through the slides, but we've got 23 slides to cover in, in 10 minutes. So you'll appreciate it's a pace. So apologies if members feel it's a bit rushed. Um, we Obviously, you can use the detail on the slides as reference material. And um, I assume that you're comfortable if we just um, run through the two agenda items together, which is all part of the slide pack. I'm going to deal with questions at the end. If you're happy with that, Chair. Yeah, that sounds good. OK, so without further ado, over to you, Nicola. OK, good morning, everyone. Can you see the slides? I can't see you. Yeah, we can see them. OK, perfect. Um, all right. So um, as David said, we're going to talk about the emergency COVID-19 highway measures and school streets. So we split this into two parts, uh, the first part being the COVID measures or pop up schemes, as we've called them. So just as a bit of a background, um, back in May, we got seven days notice to apply for £863,000 to um, put in some temporary highway measures to help with social distancing, reallocate road space to make nicer environments for people walking and cycling. With some of that in mind to help pub, um, key workers who would normally travel on public transport, we were not allowed to spend it on anything elaborate or costly. So it had to be roadworks look um, and anything that was not would not meaningfully alter the status quo on the road would not be funded. Um, this is just a bit of a graph that shows um, how traffic has changed over time. So at the very start on the left hand side, that's how it was pre-COVID. And then it goes up until I think the end of August there. But you can see the main point is that traffic dipped a lot. And so um, there was more space at that time to be able to deliver some improvements to people walking and cycling. Here's just a bit of a slide that you can look at at your leisure. because you've got the pack showing a few key things that happened along the way. We had to um, kind of ask ourselves with these measures whether or not um, we wanted to um, just put things in for the short term or whether we were looking at some things that would um, help in our longer term goals towards um, cleaner, greener recovery, which is one of the things the government asked us to do as part of these schemes. So we did look at things like our draft LC WIP, Local Cycling Walking Infrastructure Plan uh, plans, so we could see where some of the measures might be um, best to place and might have a really good take up. Um, we had eight weeks from start to finish to deliver all of the schemes for tranche one and we've done that. We've delivered 42 schemes between Hampshire County Council and our partners. One, I think one has been removed in um, response to feedback from local residents. We're very happy to adapt these schemes. We've done that in multiple locations. So we are very much watching the feedback that's coming in through the QR codes that we've got out on site and any other correspondence. Here's an example of some of the schemes. So. We've got the square in Petersfield where we put in a temporary bus gate, uh, North Walls, Winchester, where we reallocated road space for people walking, Romsey the 100 where the high street has been closed to through traffic, and then even some really little schemes like this one outside of a pharmacy in Whitchurch where we've just taken a couple of parking bays to allow people to queue to get into the pharmacy. Here's another one in Stockbridge, which was put forward by the parish council. Uh, it's been really well used. It's a great scheme there. Um, Here's our commonplace map. So you can see we asked residents and members and everyone really, schools all through the county, where they thought social distancing measures were needed. We got thousands of responses to that um, and picked a select few schemes that we could take forward. Here's a picture of the QR code that we've had out on site so that people can give us feedback. There's an email address there as well. And then here's an example on the left of some of the feedback we've had. So this is one of the schemes in Fishers Hill in Titchfield Fairham where we've put in a modal filter to stop through traffic um, on a route that, that um, the LC Whip suggested would be well taken up by cyclists if we did that. It's also had a surprising effect of encouraging brand new walkers onto the route. And I don't think there's a day that goes past now where it's not full of people walking. Maybe today, it's not so nice today. Um, we're monitoring all of the schemes through um, feedback from boroughs, districts, all of our partners through the SUSTRAN space to move tool, which is that QR code. 
also commonplace platform and our social media feeds. And we've got quantitative data coming out from weekly on-site observations, surveys where they're appropriate, and a review of Google traffic data as well. So we're not able to use our normal enumerators in the same way that we would, well, do in normal times, um, because a lot of them are volunteers um, or older as well. So we've got to consider the risks through COVID. Experiences and lesson learned is the thing that we wanted to focus on a bit more. I will just pick out a few of these because we don't have time for all. So consultation, engagement and public opinion. As you can probably tell, we didn't have very long to go through committee meetings and get consultation on all of these measures. They were emergency measures. So we've had to get feedback whilst we're on site, which isn't our preferred method, but it has been an interesting uh, experience and something that we've taken a lot away from. Um, public opinion at the time, um, at the beginning of the period when that traffic level was really low was um, more in support than it has been as the traffic level is rising. Um, but I would say that we are starting to hear through the QR codes from a lot of what would normally be the, the silent majority, people who do like the schemes and do want uh, more things put in for walking and cycling. Um, travel is changing is another one I just want to dwell on. So this is to say that um, whilst we might be seeing more trips happening now on the network, it's not necessarily the same trips that were happening before. And I think that focuses back on David's presentation. A lot of people are still working from home. So these some of the trips might be that people don't want to car share anymore, don't want to take public transport at the moment. Um, so we've got to keep a very close eye on how travel is changing. Next one is there's a risk versus it looks like roadworks. We've had to use materials that, that look like roadworks, like these Jersey waterfield barriers, for example. Um, one, because the DFT told us to, but also because we've put them in under temporary traffic regulation orders where we have to follow something called Chapter 8 regulations. As we move towards the tranche two of our funding, we will be able to start replacing that with some nicer looking stuff. Um, I think probably the last two that I'd like to focus on are trial and adapt. So we have been trialing a lot of new things through this period, um, modal filters and um, taking road space away from parking or um, motor vehicles in, in certain locations. Um, we've adapted it as we've gone along. And this fits in really nicely to some of our new draft walking and cycling principles. And agile working um, is the last one I want to focus on, which is the fact that the teams have worked incredibly well together over this time. We've had a pop-up meeting every morning at 8.30 for the last few, well, six months maybe. And the teams have delivered 42 schemes in that period of time. So I think that's a, a, a good lesson that we can be very agile. Tranche two, we've put in a bid for a further three and a half million and we're expecting to hear on that soon. There's full details on the link there if you wanted to take a look. School streets is the next item. Um, so is everyone still there? I'm just checking. Yeah, we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's okay. We're all on mute. Okay, that's fine. Um, I just can't see anyone. So um, school streets, this is the next part of the presentation. Obviously, there was a, um, a full council meeting on this a couple of weeks back, and we've been asked to bring more information back now. So um, I think the key things about school streets are that they are about restrictions on motorised traffic around school at drop off and pick up times. They are more around modal shift than they are around road safety and with a focus on air quality. Um, there are a lot of benefits to them, but there are also a lot of challenges. So obvious improvements might be helping to improve air quality, making the environments around schools nicer, helps to meet some of our other physical activity strategies and our climate change strategy and all of these good things. There are some challenges though, because it will not be suitable for all schools. So schools that are on main roads or bus routes, that would be very difficult. Um, there are liability and safety issues to overcome, particularly allowing third parties to close roads on our behalf. Um, and at the moment, we don't have some of the back office powers that would be needed for moving traffic enforcement, for example. So there's a lot of things to overcome. It would take time for us to get a good um, process in place, but the benefits make it worthwhile for us to try it. Um, as, as these are kind of similar things that are on the last slide, so I'll leave that one to you to have a look at. What we already do with schools is a huge amount. We've got a school travel plans team that does uh, a, a, a whole load of work with all of the schools across the county. They um, run travel plans. We've got the school crossing patrol service. Um, we have park and stride sites. We teach children in bikeability. We have junior road safety officers. There's a lot that we already do. Um, and on air quality in particular, um, they've been delivering an air quality program in around 30 schools over the last few years promoting Clean Air Day and this year running a poster competition as well because we can't um, be in those schools as much as before. 
Um, when it comes to resolution for um, trialling school streets in Hampshire, we can learn from some others. So Southampton City Council has already been doing this for the last year or so, and our traded services teams have helped them with some of their arrangements. Um, Gloucester and Shropshire were mentioned, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and we've had a little look into what they're already doing. Um, and we've got some contacts in Oxfordshire who are also delivering this, so we can follow what they're doing. Um, next steps for us would be to secure funding and approval for some pilots, um, probably with a cross-section of um, urban and rural geography. But the key thing here is that they must be well supported by the school and probably with schools that we've already worked with a lot in the past because um, we can then know that they've got good relationships with the communities and the communities are going to be up for trialling these things. Um, we look to trial a variety of options, and, um, so maybe some signed closures, maybe some enforcement enforced closures with staff on site from the schools, and then evaluate and share the lessons that we learn. In the longer term, we may be able to make more permanent changes. Um, we may be able to use things like ANPR, moving traffic enforcement, but we can't do that in the short term because we don't have those powers yet. Um, interest to date. We have had some interest from schools around this already. Um, we had that COVID map, which I've shown you earlier, the one we used on Commonplace. And also we put out some correspondence to schools ahead of them reopening in September. And we've heard back from 13 schools, um, including a couple where we have already helped them with some measures. So Harrison Primary School and Everest Academy. There's been some measures in place very recently. Um, on this list of schools here, this isn't to say that this is the, the list that we would be picking from. There is no evaluation of these to date. There's no selection criteria set at this moment. So um, it's not a, an, a closed list. Um, we're suggesting the resource requirements. We would like us to have a short trial, uh, limited in numbers, because we'd be looking to use uh, to reallocate some of the emergency active travel fund tranche two money if we get it. So we'll probably be looking at about two or three, um, and that would need you know, staff resource to manage and, evalu and evaluate it and um, volunteers from the schools, um, recruitment and training. It's a lot of things that would have to be in place. And then um, if this was all successful, we could aim to have a, a, a pilot running in the next academic year. Last slide. Um, so our considerations that we would put forward in developing and recommendations would be to note all of the work that we already do with schools to note the practicalities and the costs for setting up a school streets program, the practicalities is the most important bit. Um, and also to note the, the role of schools and volunteers and the importance of establishing a dialogue with them to find out what they need. And I think I'm done. Thank you, Nicola. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and it covered everything I wanted it to cover. So thank you. Um, Members, would you like to please use the raise hand function if you have questions for David and Nicola about the presentation? Uh, and I can see Councillor Mellor uh, has his hand up. I'll come to you first. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've just got uh, two questions to pose to Nicola relating to the pop-up schemes. Um, we had some very short-term projects, as you highlighted in your presentation. With a view to permanency, what data are you actually going to collate or use to justify continuity or deletion of the uh, the current pop-up schemes? Um, it's something that we're it's something that we're working on at the moment. We've got a lot of information that we're collecting on a weekly basis, anyway. Um, but. For now, we've got funding to keep the pop-ups in place until the Emergency Active Travel Fund Round 1 runs out, which is later in the year. So we do have to make a, um, some assessment of which we would maybe like to keep longer term. Um, we can look at things like the space to move feedback that we've been getting, but also I think we'd be looking at strong evidence base like the local cycling walking infrastructure plan so we could see where in the long term demand would help to meet our longer term objectives. Well, I was thinking a bit more of, say, footfall or uh, uh, yes, against, we are. against the dropping car movement, for an example. Yes, we are collecting um, footfall data, and I think um, the car data is, like I say, we've had to use Google data in some locations, so we're able to compare capacity, but before and after, using that historic data. Um, in some other locations, we are going out and collecting traffic data, but um, I'm sure you'd appreciate we don't have traffic data on every street in the county, so sometimes that before data hasn't mm. been available. 
Thank you. Uh, and there's a, if I may, uh, Chair, supplementary on this. Um, with the new, the second tranche, I don't know what uh, sort of uh, money we're going to get confirmed by the government, but what's your system for analysing other areas or is it still going to be solely focused on uh, high streets and, uh, uh, and whatever? Um, there are lots of new suggestions coming in. Um, can you uh, um, could you advise everybody as to what the system is that you're going to adopt to uh, judge those uh, proposals? So the bid for tranche two, because we had a little bit longer, we had about a month to prepare that. The schemes that are within that have already been allocated and uh, the bid details are in the presentation that I've got there. So you can go and have a look at the link. They're not all town centre locations. So there are some on key key routes um, and uh, some also some revenue funding to help with different measures like um, uh, perhaps e-bike loans to some a select number of businesses so we can trial some other types of innovation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Muller. Um, Councillor Hughes next, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Nicola, thank you very much for the, uh, the presentation. It's really useful. I have, I have one question on the pop-ups. And then I have three questions on the street schools. So can I do the pop up first? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious to know what the impact is on businesses to these pop ups, uh, particularly where um, on street parking spaces have been removed, which would have been convenient for those businesses. Um, I'm a habit by councillor and we're getting a lot of um, um, comments from local businesses saying that these are not helping their businesses recover particularly after COVID. Is there any consideration given to the, the balance between impacts on the business and the potential safe, perceived safety requirements for individuals? Yes, absolutely there is. Um, even in tranche one, where we had a very limited amount of time to get schemes in, we did try where we could to engage with businesses in advance. Um, where we haven't been able to do that, we've been speaking with them where we can throughout the, you know, the, the period when the schemes are in. So Petersfield would be a good example of that, where there was on-street parking reallocated to people walking on um, Lavent Street at the start of the scheme, but the, re the businesses felt that that wasn't helping them. And we got feedback that some of the people walking didn't feel that it was that helpful either. So that bit was taken out whilst other elements of the scheme were retained. I think in Haven, a number of the schemes are being managed by the Borough Council itself. So the businesses would probably be speaking with them directly. Um, but yes, we are where we're able to, we are doing that. Excellent. Th thank you for that. It's really helpful. Um, in terms of street schools, um, my, my concern about any measures that are brought in it always results in displacement of traffic elsewhere. So you limit traffic access to a particular uh, geographical area around the school. What happens is all those uh, residential areas around it, they're not really designed for that type of traffic, become inundated with additional vehicles. Um, so that's a concern. Um, has there been any consideration about the impact of e-scooters because they're more and more prevalent, which do scare me actually. I see young people riding around on e-scooters on public roads with no uh, headgear, no uh, safety equipment at all whatsoever. I think that's an issue. And, and I'm really pleased that um, you recognise that not all schools will be appropriate uh, for this scheme. And I wonder whether any analysis has been undertaken to determine schools that might be suitable, but also equally important that those schools are clearly not suitable when there are, no, I'm sure that I know there are some in my division. Um, I've noted down as many points as I could from that, but the traffic <laughs> displacement, the traffic displacement one, um, yes, I mean, there's two points on that. The first would be that um, where we've seen this happen in Southampton, they've done surveys that showed that most residents didn't feel that there was a displacement issue. Um, I suppose you are spreading out the cluster that would occur right outside of a school over perhaps a few more locations than you might before. But in any case, the residents in those trials haven't felt that there was displacement. And at some point, if it is further and further away from the school gate, it will become more convenient for people to walk. And that's why I say mode shift is the most important part of this. It's not stopping people who have to drive to the school in doing so, but it's making a nicer environment so that they're encouraged to walk. Um, the e-scooters point, um, I mean, e-scooters are illegal on the highway at the moment. Um, we are working in conjunction with the Department of Transport Department for Transport on a trial um, that will be forthcoming, but um, outside of those trials, they're not legal and we're not working on any projects to support that. Um, I think those were the main points. Oh, the criteria. Um, the criteria, no, that hasn't been decided yet. This is our, our first um, presentation on this and we would look to work on some criteria in the coming months if it's supported. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. 
Um, I've got four more members wishing to speak, um, and I'm keen to get to everyone, so let's please try and be as brief as possible. Uh, Councillor Todd, next, please. Um, uh, thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you to uh, Nicola Wright for everything that you're doing, um, because it, it's definitely made a real difference. Um, an interesting, just an observation on, on the business side of things. The reason I was late is I was meeting businesses in the square in Winchester, which has been closed to through traffic, and the feedback from them was they want us to be uh, more ambitious and radical in our plans, um, which was very encouraging, and uh, that's what we're intending to try and make possible. Um, I'm pleased that um, I, I'm getting a lot of concern from schools. They seem to have more car traffic back than they did in the pre-COVID era, and it's causing major issues. Uh, and I'm pleased that two of the schools that have been contacting me are on your list. So I, I, I'm a strong supporter of the idea that we move ahead with a pilot. Um, one of the things that's very striking about the original Grant Chaps announcement um, is that it was wider in scope, certainly than the kind of measures we've ended up with in Winchester, which are perhaps rightly for the first phase, focused on getting people into the centre and reusing our centres. But as well as school streets, which was in, a, in the original announcement, there are things like extension of 20 mile an hour zones, which we would at some point support moving the 20 mile an hour scheme in Winchester to a, an all city, more logical basis, pedestrian and cycle zones, low traffic neighbourhoods, greater use of modal barriers. So not just looking to get people into the centre, important though that is, but also actually creating um, more active travel in people's immediate neighbourhoods. And I just wondered, is that something that the new schemes will be doing more of? Is it something that we can find a way to move ahead, either inside or outside the context of all of this? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, in tranche one, we've had two mo three modal filters go in um, in different locations that are not just town centres. So two in uh, one on a residential area and one on a main route between Fairham and Sedgensworth. Um, so we have trialled those. Um, and then I would say that, you know, obviously the budget for tranche one was limited. The budget for tranche two is limited, but there is a low traffic neighbourhood kit that we've put a bid in for. So we would buy different bits of um, equipment that allow us to trial low traffic neighbourhoods, starting in one location and then over time moving it to a different location. So we can work with the communities to see how it might work and amend it as we go through. Um, outside of the Emergency Active Travel Fund, yes, I mean, we're working on some draft um, walking and cycling principles, as I think you're aware of, which do include the concept of low traffic neighbourhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Todd. Um, I'm going to go next to Councillor Withers, please, for your question. Uh, Nicola, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm involved in a cross-party uh, study looking at pilot for um, school streets as well as the Mini Holland project that's been in Waltham Forest, which was, uh, we had a great visit there and we are working with them, looking at their ideas and trying to incorporate them in all the shops, particularly in the North Lane area. And as far as um, school streets are concerned, we have a nursery, an infant and um, a junior school in very close proximity, which have major um, car parking in the morning and, and the afternoon problems affecting the local residents and obviously the bus routes as well. So I put my hand up to be only too pleased for certainly that area as part of our mini Holland uh, project, uh, which I think is very important, which has come out today, um, as an example in the northeast area of Hampshire. Okay, thank you very much. If, you, if you'd like to email me any details, then I'd be happy to have a chat with you about that. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And um, next it's Council Curl, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, uh, and as I say, thank you very much indeed for the presentation, which was very interesting. I was just wondering actually whether or not there were any, um, uh, whether there was any uh, opportunity or whether there are any um, ambitions or whatever to do any um, specific air quality monitoring, et cetera, outside schools. Um, given that uh, clearly since the schools have reopened after the lockdown, uh, we have seen a significant or return in effect to uh, car travel basically being the same as it was, I'm afraid, certainly in some of the school areas, uh, schools outside schools where in my division, um, as was pre, obviously, uh, COVID. 
um, and, and obviously the associated, associated chaos, et cetera, that, um, that that's ensuing and, and bad feeling with residents as well. So I was just wondering whether we were actually got any plans to do any more air quality monitoring, because actually I think statistics and showing those sorts of uh, uh, air quality issues, et cetera, that may be generated by um, uh, school transport traffic actually really could be a good driver to get people to think twice or about driving their children to school. Um, and also with regards to um, uh, existing cycle lanes, if you like, and obviously pop up lines, um, I do sometimes worry so that uh, we still see cyclists um, cycling quite happily on A roads when perfectly right next to them, uh, the councils have spent quite a considerable amount of time uh, creating a wide, a very wide pathway for people to cycle on. But when they're actually asked about it, they say, oh, well, I didn't even know it was one because the signage was so small and that they're quite happy to drive and, and mix amongst um, HGV lorries. So I was just wondering whether or not uh, we could possibly look at signage, if you like, and trying to encourage more people to use the cycle lanes that do exist. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so the two points there, the first one, um, air quality monitoring. Um, air quality monitoring is quite a complex issue and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not the expert on it, but um, I'm aware that the responsibilities for air quality monitoring predominantly sit with the boroughs and districts. Um, so in any trial that we take forward, we'd be looking ideally to partner with boroughs and districts to, to make sure we can do some um, some good monitoring at those school sites. I think it's worth taking into consideration though that it won't be the only um, performance indicator of these trials because COVID will have such a large impact on the before and after data or perhaps if a school is located, um, we were talking earlier David and I about any schools that might be located in, um, in the New Forest, um, the power station there is one of the largest contributors to the air quality. So um, it couldn't just be the only thing that we look at, uh, but certainly we'd like to work with the boroughs and districts in, in their ability to monitor that. Um, the second point about existing cycle lanes, um, I think there are a, a number of um, issues with the existing cycle lanes, which we're looking to address in our Active Places Summit, which we're hosting on the 19th of October, and you'd be very welcome to join us. There's been a new um, set of government guidance that's come out in the last couple of months in their gear change policy called Local Transport Note 120, which is um, all about cycling infrastructure and it updates a note that's from 2008 now and really reflects the change in um, how cycling is expected to be delivered for. And there is a, a move away from delivering shared use paths because um, they're not seen to be comfortable by people walking or people cycling. Um, so there's a push towards more segregated facilities, but of course that will be de location dependent. And that's something that we're working through with this Active Places work. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Councillor Carr, for your question. Um, Councillor Benison, uh, please ask your question now. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> And uh, thank you, Nicola, for <clears throat> your report. Um, going, looking back to the 20 mile an hour um, outside of schools, um, I, I think perhaps if we were to look at the hundreds of schools in Hampshire, I suspect there won't be that many that will be um, able to have roads closed uh, for a period of time. But I suspect it might help them, the ones that couldn't be uh, closed, to have a 20 mile an hour speed limit outside. Um, uh, could you just uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Can, uh, is there a, a 20 miles an outside every school? Can we have that? Uh, is there a blanket thing that we can do on it? Um, I'd say as on air quality, I'm not the expert on 20 mile an hour outside schools, I'm afraid. I don't know if David wants to offer anything additional on that. Otherwise, we can go away and answer the question. Um, I, I'm not an expert on 20 mile an hour zones either, but I think I can add that there was a trial a number of years ago on 20 mile an hour zones. We, we don't routinely um, introduce them and it's perhaps not the most effective solution outside schools but it could be something that we look at in combination with um, any trial that we move forward because there will be an opportunity to have temp possibly temporary closures or temporary restrictions of some sort at school times. So it is something that we could consider and can back you possibly into scrutiny in a, in the, in, with more detail in the January report. Yeah, I think that, it is worth considering. That would be very useful. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, and Councillor Todd, I can see you've got your hand up and would like to ask another question. Please do briefly. Thank you very much, Chair. It's much appreciated. Yes, I, one of the points that was made by Councillor Porter at the beginning related to the fact that the path was unsuitable outside the school that, um, and this, this is the, the new school in King's Barton in Winchester, uh, and that the, the paving of the cycle path wasn't particularly relative, uh, good enough quality in that particular space. So I suppose my question about school streets is, if we do pilots, will we just be looking within the scope of a strictly defined school, school street, temporary barrier put in on the day, or would it make sense to take more of an area approach, looking at wider infrastructure, maybe considering low traffic neighbourhood type interventions alongside a school street measure? Does it make sense to do shall we say, a more ambitious and comprehensive approach within our pilots, or are, is the intention to just look at this one measure as currently defined as a school street? Um, thank you. I think that we'd be you know, open to hearing different suggestions for what should be included in the, in the trials. It's not fixed by any means at this point. Um, but I think the most complicated things for us to try and understand and, and find a solution to within these trials will be the um, regulatory and um, liability issues. So we really want to ensure that any trial includes those types of things because I think those will be our biggest challenge. I think Nicola also worth adding that you know we haven't secured funding for these trials. It's dependent on the outcome of the tranche two bid and it, school streets were not included in our tranche two bid. So we have to, you know, we've already had a, a quiet discussion with senior um, representatives at the DFT and we need to adapt our uh, bid slightly to allow us to do a small pilot with two or three trial sites. So we perhaps don't want to be too ambitious oh. at this stage in terms oh, of... Sorry, just a quick follow-up to that. Are there opportunities to consider other sources of funding? I mean, most obviously, because it's a reflection of increased you could certainly make a case that school pressure outside school gates reflects extra development pressure in many cases that there may be conversations to be had either looking at the county sill budget which i believe only winchester has provided or um asking talking to districts about their sill funding if that if funding proves an obstacle I think that's a sensible suggestion and I think you know there is an opportunity to look at um, 106 funding that we hold and also still funding in certain district areas and, and that's possibly a way forward but I think as far as this is school streets trial we're talking about it'd be sensible to limit it to something that's manageable in the first instance but again we could cover that in the in a report. Thank you David and thank you Councillor Todd. Um, I'd like to go to Councillor Humby next, because I know that, Rob, you've been very closely involved in the pop-up schemes. So it'd be really helpful to have your reflections on how it went and the lessons learned and your thoughts on, on where we go next on school streets. So, yeah, Councillor Humby, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman, uh, for the opportunity. Um, first of all, uh, excellent presentation and a big thank you to David, especially for, for Nicola for running through, which is a very quickly which we probably could have taken a few hours to go through to get all the detail on there so i thank you for that i would just say initially on the pop-up schemes i think we do need to recognize the speed that the team had to work at we were given effectively no time at all to put that together and i say that in the context that i had a quite a bit of pushback from members and the public and businesses about the lack of consultation i think nicola has explained that very clearly that the speed we had to work at we had to get on and implement schemes, which is why we said we would review them every two or three weeks. And I think you heard Nicola say, you know, having a meeting every Monday morning and we have adapted those schemes. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we are in a position where where we've had um, businesses and residents say they think we could do it differently. We've adapted them and indeed some of them we've actually taken out. Now, we have got a bit more time on the second tranche, so there will be time for a bit more consultation uh, within that. So thank you to the team for implementing that so quickly. I think it is, it's been a real achievement. On the school streets, Mr Chairman, if you remember at full council when Councillor Porter bought the motion, I did say my preference was to go to your committee, and I'm really pleased that it has done. 
because listening to the conversation, the comments that have been made, I think clearly demonstrates there are a lot of issues, a lot of benefits, but there are a lot of issues. And one of the slides, I still put it up, that Nicola put up was the benefits and challenges, clearly demonstrates why it needed to go to your committee. Because this won't be one size fits all. With, there will have to be a working relationship and a great deal of involvement with the schools and a commitment from them as well. And there are a lot of issues around the controls that schools or staff at the schools can have by actually working on the, you know, a live highway network. So I really welcome the opportunity and have listened very carefully, Mr. Chairman, to the debate. I think going forward, yes, there's the suggestion of a, sort of a, a trials that we need to do um, and, and see how that works. But that will be initially in a very limited way. But maybe that can set the path for how we can set down the criteria so we understand when we start to analyse each school potentially how we're going to do that. But it will need to be funded, Mr Chairman. I made this point at full council. So even that work will need to be funded. And there's limited opportunity through that, through the uh, Emergency Act for Trevor scheme. But I also know that Councillor Todd said, you know, are there other opportunities which David Wilson said we need to look at? So a very good debate, Mr Chairman. I think it gives us a way to go forward and very much interested to see how we, how we do that and how we look at uh, trials in the first instance. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Humby. And I would echo everything you said. But, you know, we want real world solutions as a committee. We recognise the challenges, we all do. And I completely agree, we, we need to tailor the solutions to the particular school. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just sum up if, if I can. I, I was really impressed by how much has been done already uh, working with schools. I didn't know about all of that. And I was pleased to learn that there are 13 schools willing to engage now in further measures um, who can be part of a pilot scheme. I think there's so much interest in this issue on this committee that we would like this to come back to us before it goes to Cabinet uh, in January. And um, I'm confident that when it does come back to us, um, David and Nicola will have developed a plan uh, for some pilot schemes or in a range, a mix of different schools. And the challenge is to devise cost effective schemes that have the least admin possible. We do not want to be putting admin burdens on schools. Uh, we all know how much admin schools have to deal with. So we have to, we have to try and find a way of uh, making it easy for them and e easy for us that does, doesn't impose a huge burden on us. Hopefully by January we'll know whether we're getting this 3.45 million that we've applied for in tranche two and that will then um, give us, give us a, the knowledge that we've got some resources there to proceed with these pilots um, and I think we'd really as a committee just request that 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 process proceeds as urgently as swiftly as possible with a view to then uh, being able to roll out those lessons learned to other schools. And um, so that would be my attempt at summing up. Has any member got anything to add to, to what I've said there? Um, please put your hand up if you do. Uh, I can't see any hands up, so I assume I've summed up satisfactorily to everyone. And I'd like to thank David and Nicola, and we'll look forward to hearing back from you at our January meeting um, with your plan. And we'll, we'll then have another good detailed look at your proposals. So thank you very much. Good, thank you, Jim. Thank you. So turning now to item nine, which is the planning white paper. And uh, I'd like to, Welcome Chris Murray back to this committee, another friend of the committee. And um, I think this is a really important item for us to look at. This is a white paper, I'm sure you're all aware of it, that, that came out oh, a couple of months ago now. Um, and uh, it's got huge implications for all of us in Hampshire. And I think we've all got concerns, but first, before we come to our concerns, let's give Chris a chance to do his presentation. Chris, if you can keep it to 10 to 12 minutes, that would be appreciated. Um, please go ahead now. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, good morning, members. I'll um, 
just try and share my presentation with you. You just bear with me. So are you seeing that, um, um, Chairman? Yeah, we can see that. If you put the full screen on, then I think that would also be good. Bear with me. OK. Yeah, that's it. So this um, this uh, consultation proposes um, significant and wide ranging changes to the planning system. Um, the consultation was actually uh, the white paper consultation was actually accompanied by a, a further consultation relating to changes to the current planning system. So on the 6th of August, I think it was, we had the two consultations planning for the future that, that really looks at long term significant and fundamental change to the planning system and then secondly the changes to the current system which will be uh, an interim approach so we have those two two um two documents just very quickly on um the uh the changes to the current system if i can just talk about that first that um set out four main proposals and the most controversial of those was the proposed changes to the standard method for assessing housing requirements um, and what this uh, new methodology appeared to um, result in was increasing housing uh, housing requirements in the south of England that was the first thing but also an increase um, a, an apparent increase in, in rural areas as a result of um, elements within the methodology which took account of past delivery but also an adjustment for affordability so the areas that were seen as least affordable were getting a disproportionate or it appeared a disproportionate additional requirement for housing as you can imagine the uh, that that resulted in um, a lot of concern particularly across rural authorities um, and the response to that consultation that we that we submitted on the 1st of october very much majored on the, the the approach that methodology was taking and whether that was appropriate or not. And there was other elements within there that are set out just on that slide relating to um, affordable housing and a reduction in the threshold for provision of affordable housing and an extension of uh, something which is known as permissioning principle um, to include a wider range of developments and in particular major developments. So the response to that consultation the chairman was submitted last week so turning to planning for the future, um, the white paper, as I've said, proposes very fundamental um, reform to the planning system, which has been, largely been in place since 1947 when the first planning act uh, was put in place. Uh, it's been changed, tinkered with um, over the decades, um, and that has generally resulted in uh, a, a complication of the, uh, of the planning process, both plan making and and development management uh, and the government are keen to try and streamline and standardize that uh, that process which has, uh, has become very cumbersome over the years so that general ambition i think um is supported i think most planners and, and those in local government would agree that the, the system that we have now is very long-winded cumbersome and and not that easy for for, for the public to understand um, what the government are looking for is, a, is a very much a digital first approach, um, trying to make documents machine readable, I think is the term that's used in the document. There is a focus on design and um, sustainability and particularly a proposal to introduce a national design code. Um, there is also um, a, a, a good section of the um, consultation that re refers to infrastructure delivery and how developer contributions are collected and I'll come to that. Uh, in a minute and essentially as you might expect really at the heart of the of the changes is the need to try and ensure more land is available for 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 uh, house building um, the government have a ambition to deliver 300,000 homes a year last year nationally we delivered 241,000 and local plans that are in, in place across the country plan for I think it's something like 180,000 homes a year so way below the the level government are uh, are looking for so the white paper proposes three pillars three there's three main elements to it planning for development planning for beautiful and sustainable places and planning for infrastructure and connected places um, so the first pillar 
Um, this very much looks at the local plan process um, and looks to, to standardise it and digitise it, make it very much more map led. And it proposes that local plans designate land in, in one of three categories, growth, renewal um, or pro uh, protected. Um, and land that would be designated for growth would be um, large scale developments, urban extensions, new settlements, um, things of that nature, the big, big areas of development. And those areas would be automatically granted outline planning permission. The um, second area would be land categorised as renewal. Um, that would primarily relate to areas that are already um, predominantly developed. Um, and again, in principle, development will be acceptable in these areas. What the document talks about is a gentle densification and infill of residential areas under this uh, renewal banner. And then the third category is um, protected. And in these areas, um, there will be no automatic granting of planning permission and um, planning proposals will be dealt largely as they are now through the, uh, through the development management process, but very much in line with national uh, policy set out in the NPPF. In terms of the, um, the local plan process, the ambition is to try and reduce the statutory, uh, or in, rather impose a statutory period of 30 months for the, for the um, production of a local plan. Now, to put that in some context, the average time taken now is something like seven years to create a local plan. So government are clearly aiming to uh, greatly reduce that um, process, to shorten the consultation period, but make it more meaningful and try and ensure that the public are engaged at the local plan stage, not at the planning application stage, which is often the case now. Um, and there are also proposals to have rigid timescales for de designing planning applications with potentially financial penalties or withdrawal of your planning fee if those decisions are not made. So some fairly radical changes there to, to the local plan process. In terms of a pillar two, planning for beautiful and sustainable places, this largely focuses on um, design and the introduction of a, a national model design code um, later this year. We already have a national design guide, but what is proposed is something that is much more prescriptive in terms of design standards that would be nationally, um, apply nationally across the country. Um, this would include the hierarchy of public spaces, uh, car parking arrangements, placement of streets and landscaping, etc., and the provision of um, pedestrian and cycling um, facilities. That national code then would be um, would be interpreted locally, and government still would would expect local design codes to be to be pr provided. That again would be produced in consultation with local communities. And the third pillar uh, is planning for infrastructure in connected places, and this focuses very much on the introduction of a of a new method for collecting development con contributions. As members will be aware, currently um, developer contributions are collected either through a Section 106 agreement or through um, a community infrastructure levy. Um, and the proposal is to re replace both with a national infrastructure levy that would be nationally set uh, based on a flat rate and would be charged on the final value of development and on the occupation of uh, new uh, development rather than on commencement, which is which is the, the current process. What that means then is that um, those contributions would be collected uh, more towards the, the end of a development uh, process rather than at the beginning as, as now. Um, that has implications for um, uh, the infrastructure delivery and the ability to be able to provide that infrastructure in advance of development or, or in parallel to it. Um, government uh, make it clear that they would make provisions for government for sorry for um, local authorities to borrow money in order to uh, to to deliver infrastructure in parallel with development. Um, another interesting element is that um, section one six section one six agreements, of course, aren't just used to deliver infrastructure. They're, they're used for a range of obligations that can't normally be um, dealt with under planning condition. So there's a question mark about how those things would be um, 
delivered through, through the planning process. So there are a number of issues for the uh, for the county council that um, that we're starting to think about, and, and just to remind members, the the deadline for submission of, of comments on the consultation is the 29th of October, um, and the the comments that we will be putting together will be agreed by the leader and deputy leader before before they're submitted. Um, a number of issues though emerging. Um, I think we we will be supporting. The efforts to simplify the planning system. I think um, there is a need for great, greater clarity uh, and uh, a simplification of, of much of the of the planning processes. Um, but it's the devil. The devil, of course, is in the detail of how that will be delivered. The consultation is fairly high level, so there's not a, a lot of detail yet. It's a, it's a document that isn't much uh, beyond 50 pages. If if you're keen to read it yourself. Um, but the, the issues for the county, first is the infrastructure delivery. We've been very successful in using Section 106 historically to fund um, infrastructure, obviously uh, transport infrastructure, education, etc. cetera. Um, the levy that will be set nationally, it's unclear how that would be distributed, whether we would be uh, a collecting authority or not. It appears not. It appears that that would go to the local planning authorities, so it would be in the, the hands of the districts, as is the case now. Um, and um, I think there are concerns about the proposals to introduce a zoning system under the three headings I've described. It does seem to be a blunt instrument and it removes, I think, some of the, the local distinctiveness uh, uh, from the planning process. Um, and I think also um, the, the speeding up of the plant, local plan process would seem to uh, remove some of the, the democracy, if you like, from the process. Um, there is a concern that um, you know, an attempt to speed up the local plan process while at the same time um, delivering a best-in-class public uh, engagement process. There, there appears to be a conflicting ambition there that, that would need to be looked at very carefully. Um, there's also a proposal to abolish the, the duty to cooperate, um, and that will be interesting to see what, if anything, replaces that in terms of how we plan more strategically across broader areas. Uh, in the absence of regional planning or higher level strategic planning and in the absence of the duty to cooperate um, it's difficult to see how planning for wider infrastructure for example our transport infrastructure and indeed our minerals and waste planning would work without that duty to to cooperate so just some issues there chairman to think about uh, that we will be um, incorporating into our response so happy to to take questions thanks Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, that was a very helpful presentation and um, we've got a number of questions. I just want to let members know that after this meeting, I intend to write a letter to the leader and deputy leader setting out the committee's views and concerns. Um, so we'll, we'll be listening very closely to those. I think we all are concerned about points you had on that final slide. The loss of control over over the infrastructure spending from this levy, urban and rural landscapes, um, etc. So let's um let's take some questions, comments now from members. Councillor Simpson, please go first. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Chris, I was interested in one of your final points in the report. The proposal to identify all land under three headings is a blunt instrument. It does not appear sufficiently sophisticated to consider and retain the quality and diversity of places across Hampshire. Now, I've interpreted that, interpreted that as a bit of a mess. In fact, a dog's breakfast, and, and it's actually going to ruin Hampshire. Uh, first of all, is that correct? But more importantly, as you dig into this, the whole of the white paper seems to be about what the planning process is, not about delivery after planning permission. Now, as I recollect, some 10,000 houses are unbuilt at present and there is nothing to be done. Surely what we should be looking at is saying that you have, as at current, three years in which to start a development we should say you have to finish it within five or you will be fined. 
Now, that could be a thousand pound, ten thousand pound per house. But the fact is, it means the developers, instead of sitting on their land banks, would actually develop the houses. And then much of our problem would dissipate because the houses are being built and not just being left behind. Um, I don't know whether you think that's a, a goer, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but perhaps you could say. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Uh, just taking the second point first, if I, if I may, I think one of the one of the uh, issues that we would want to raise in any uh, response is the lack of uh, of any measure to to hold the development industry accountable for the for the lack of delivery of, of housing uh, and the fact that we have, as you've mentioned, the many unim unimplemented planning commissions um, that are not being brought forward, and there is nothing of substance within the consultation to address that as has been the case for a number of years now, the failure to deliver has been, has been uh, put at the feet of the local authorities. And I think that needs to be, there needs to be better balance there and uh, recognition that um, local planning authorities can only do so much in terms of delivery. And it's the development industry that needs to, that needs to, to uh, be held account for, for, for some of that. So I, I agree with that. And I think we do need to raise that in our response. On the first issue, um, the introduction of the zoning um, is, it's been used in other countries um, and it's been used you know, to, to, a degree, to a degree of success um, in some areas. But in, I think in, uh, in England, it's, it's difficult to see how it would work in some of the complex areas that we have where you've got a lot of historic development uh, and a lot of that in heritage areas as well, of course. Um, and you've got um, the interface between the, the urban and rural. And it's, a, it's a fairly complex um, environment that we're working within. And to try and zone all land within that, um, within that uh, framework under, under three categories seems extremely difficult to do. And, and I, I, I think it just feels to me like it would be uh, a very unsophisticated way to try and plan for our communities uh, going forward. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Councillor Simpson. Um, we'll go next to Councillor Philpott, please. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, an IT issue there. Apologies. Uh, first off, congratulations. Uh, not just thanks, but congratulations to Chris uh, for, uh, for being able to consolidate such an incredibly complex subject in just 10 minutes. Uh, I've got three questions, if I may, and I'll be as brief as I possibly can with those questions, Chairman. Um, Chris, Proposal 8 of the, uh, of the Planning for the Future document sets out five stages to create a, a local plan, and the total time frame envisaged is 30 months for delivery of that plan. Uh, a number of district councils have raised concerns that this length of time is unrealistic, what I'd like to know from you is whether you, uh, whether Hampshire County Council officers share those concerns uh, in the context of the minerals and waste local plan. That's the first question. Shall I ask the others, Chairman? Yeah, please do. Okay. Question two, then. A, a number of councils, uh, Chris, and councillors have raised concerns about the proposals to require developers to make contributions to infrastructure costs only at the point of occupation. Uh, proposal 21 uh, of, the, uh, of the white paper suggests that uh, risks should be transferred from developers to local authorities. So the question is, do you envisage that uh, there's dangers in this proposal for the county council? And, uh, and should we not be looking for some form of guarantees to protect ourselves in the event that developers fail to deliver on those circumstances? Okay. And my final question, Chris, is uh, in the document, in the other document, that's the changes to the current planning system document, which has an element of overlapping onto the white paper. It's proposed to remove the uh, restrictions to the current permission in principle regulations for major development. However, I noticed that in, uh, in paragraph 97 of that document, it says, and I quote it, it says, permission in principle will not be suitable for sites in areas where applying the conservation of species and habitats regulations 2017 
there is pro there is a probability of risk that the project is likely to have significant effect on a European site unless the application was accompanied by an appropriate assessment demonstrating that there was unlikely to be significant impact on the site. Bearing that in mind, uh, what implications, Chris, do you think that may have in particular for South Hampshire, where there's been a major issue, as you're probably aware, with nitrates and phosphates on sheltered habitats? I'm sorry there's uh, quite a lot of questions there, but those are, the, those are my three questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Philpott. The, the, the first one, the 30 month period uh, and the five stages within it, uh, I think most of us that have been working in planning for, for a number of years now, like myself, would think that, that that would be a very ambitious target if you are also proposing the, the best chance to, to quote the document um, engagement with the public. Um, and those two, from my experience, don't really go together. And, Often um, uh, the the public engagement part is, is uh, an integral part of the process and, and something that can actually add time to to, to the process. So um, I think from from my experience that would be difficult. Uh, it would be critical that the local plan process, and this applies just to our, equally to our minerals and waste plan. It would be critical that you got better, much better engagement. Um, right at that early stage than we've ever done before because historically what has happened is that people have failed to engage in the local plan process and that might be down to our, our inability to engage as, as planners and local planning authorities um, but everyone suddenly appears when you get the outline planning application for, for, the, for the site that's already allocated in the plan um, and that's what the government are trying to avoid that sort of two-stage process where you go through a lot of pain in the local plan process and then you go off through all the pain again when you get an outline planning application for one of the allocated sites so that's i can see that that is something that um, would be better being simplified because there is no doubt that there is, you, you know we go through the pain twice don't we those members who have been involved in local plans and major housing sites um, have, have probably been there and we've gone through the allocation and then through the planning application so trying to get that simplified, I think, is 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 a you know a a good um, ambition. Whether you can do all of that in 30 months, um, I think that will be that will be a real challenge. Um, but the government is setting out the five stages. There's limited consultation within there. I think there are two periods. The very first stage, uh, when councils ask for information and, and potential sites, etc. Um, and ideas about where how land should be um, designated under these three categories. And then there's a stage where the plan itself, the draft plan, is consulted on. But it seems a very ambitious, a very ambitious target to to try and do all of that within 30 months. That, that's about all I can say at the moment. I think we we would struggle to produce a minerals and waste plan in that period. But we've been working with um, historic systems and historic processes, and that needs to change, of course. I think the the receiving developer contributions on occupation um, it, it will be an issue for for the county council um, at the moment we often receive contributions on commencement of development that's the normal process sill is paid on commencement of development section 106 agreement monies are usually received in stages but certainly there would be a stage on commencement and then a further uh, contribution on uh, after delivery of 100 houses for example or something of that nature so at the moment we're receiving that those contributions up front or largely up front and that will move to the end of the process um, so it puts the onus on local local authorities or infrastructure providers to go out there and borrow the money and do those works up front um, without a real guarantee that those monies will necessarily be forthcoming i'm not sure what happens if a developer gets to you know 100 houses and then then decides they're not going to build the next hundred and we and the, and the council has already committed to providing infrastructure, for example, so the current the current system allows the monies to come forward upfront and in line with the development, in parallel with the development. This would change it completely, and and there would be a risk there to, for infrastructure providers. The final one, commission in principle, it was interesting. We had a, a meeting of the Hampshire Isle of Wight Planning Officers Group, where all the district councils, borough councils attend, and that um, the permission in principle 
route to uh, to, to getting uh, the, the principle of the development established hasn't been used widely in Hampshire, and it certainly hasn't been used much in South Hampshire. And I think that's partly because of the habitat regulations that uh, requirement that's already in place. So most of the, the, the uh, planning officers from the districts were relatively relaxed about the permission in principle extension because they didn't think it would affect them greatly because of the 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 habitat regulation situation that we have in in South South Hampshire and in parts of North Hampshire as well. I don't know if that helps, Councillor, but that, that's just my initial my initial thoughts. Thank you. That is helpful, um, Councillor Curl. Next, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've actually got several comments, really, to be honest with you, although I have to, I don't know whether I have to declare it, I suppose, but obviously being a cabinet member for uh, a district authority, obviously we've been uh, involved in obviously uh, putting together our response in effect to obviously this consultation. So um, happy to go through my comments if you want me to, Chair. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly run through them. Um, I am really concerned about removing the reduction uh, threshold for affordable housing on smaller sites. I think that's a, a retrograde step, I'm afraid. We clearly do need to continue to uh, supply affordable housing. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so obviously there are issues of, I know that res uh, sorry, developers do raise about um, viability, et cetera, but the real concern about that is obviously <clears throat> their profit margin against uh, delivery of affordable homes, which I'm afraid affordable homes always, and S106, uh, um, uh, agreed contributions to the effect are always, as it were, the casualties, shall we say, of the viability argument. And, and I think we have to be really careful about that we don't speed up a process through the planning white paper that then actually erodes that even further, because clearly we do need to be delivering affordable homes. That's really a key element to that within our communities. Um, I am really concerned about the, the um, proposal to abolish the duty to cooperate, because I think that's also, again, a retrograde step. We work very, very well, I think, between districts and also the county council, etc. Uh, in my view, because we clearly do need to be able to work from a, a sort of more strategic uh, point of view as well, because clearly developments in one district will clearly have implications, potentially knock on effects in other districts, uh, but also there's potentially uh, uh, the other way. And also, obviously, you have to look at infrastructure, etc., uh, improvements, all that kind of stuff. So um, I think working, you know, transport for South Hampshire, all those sorts of things in effect are uh, of a real benefit in effect when you're looking at planning uh, locally, but also from a strategic perspective as well. So I think that that would be a real shame to remove that. Um, <clears throat> I worry about the actual proposals in the white paper. I don't think there's enough on the environment. Clearly, I know there's the MPPF there, but I do think that if you're starting to, shall we say, speed up the process, that I think we have to be very, very careful about how that potentially would be impacting on the environment. Um, I don't agree with the uh, or I'm very concerned, shall we say, about with the, the two key elements of growth and renewal, where we're saying that actually outline planning permission would be automatically granted, because I think that that's an erosion potentially on democracy. It's again, we talked about this thing earlier on in one of the other um, one of the other uh, items where we were saying, you know, it's not a one size fits all. There clearly will be constraints. There clearly will be local issues. There clearly will be things in different areas that will be of concern to people. And just to say that outline planning permission would be uh, would be just automatically granted, I think, is actually quite a, a, a worrying step, really, to be honest with you. And also the uh, uh, S106 infrastructure um, being a, a sort of a national pot that we would potentially have to bid out of or borrow out of. Um, quite rightly, I think the points have already been raised about that it being, uh, as it were, the, the elements being delivered at the end uh, by developers rather than during the process or at the beginning. Infrastructure first is something we really absolutely must be putting in because it causes all sorts of problems all the way through the system and infrastructure first is clearly something we should be uh, more wedged to rather than doing it the other way around uh, because it causes all sorts of issues on the existing network as we all members in here I'm sure will be very well aware of. Um, I do have others but I won't go on because I know there are other members that want to speak um, uh, but I, what I didn't see in the paper which I think uh, Councillor Simpson did touch on was the land banking issue by developers? I think there should be more in the white paper about saying that you should be delivering homes if you've got the app, if you've got the permission. You shouldn't just be waiting for the economic circumstances to be right to deliver those homes, because otherwise, what happens is local authorities then have to look for more land to be allocated for de for development because they need to meet their five-year land supply, etc., all that kind of stuff. And I do think that 30 months in effect for a local plan delivery is 
um, is unrealistic, frankly, because I do think you need to keep the elements of consultation, etc., in. And maybe there should be earlier engagement with um, local plan inspectors right from the beginning so that local authorities have an assurance that the travel or the direction of travel they're going with their local plan is actually more pertinent. That actually could speed up the, so the, the process because quite, ha ha quite often what happens is um, local authorities put together local plans and then they go in front of an inspector and the inspector turns around and says, well, I don't agree with that bit. Uh, you need to withdraw that or go back and look at it all again. And of course, that completely um, basically um, makes the process a lot longer or in fact the council may have to then completely change direction and look for a different element within the local plan and also longer lo local plans rather than shorter term local plans so that in effect you don't don't just adopt a local plan and then suddenly you have to go into a local plan review which then obviously you start the entire process all over again which of course you know is hugely costly hugely time costly as well um, and also doesn't give assurances to local residents and communities about where development will be going and where it won't be going. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, that's uh, rather a lot to apologise. No, thank you, Councillor Curl. And I actually think you've uh, helpfully summarised how many of us feel. Um, so, you know, your, your concerns are shared by most of the committee, is my feeling. Um, Chris, can you come back on the question of land banking and what, what there is in the white paper that seeks to stop the issue or tackle the issue of land banking? I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's much in there. Um, the, there is some, some um, minor reference to, um, to the issue. But I don't think there's much of substance that suggests how you know developers might be held to account. There is there is a little reference in there. I've got my colleague um, Tim Crouch with me. I don't know whether Tim has spotted anything that is of more substance in there that I've missed. But I don't believe there's a lot in there, uh, Chairman. Okay. Well, that's something we can flag up. Um, Tim, if you did want to contribute, please uh, let me know. Um, Right, I'm making notes, but I, I I know that we've got two more speakers. So firstly, can I go to Councillor Hughes and then it will be Councillor Todd. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I must declare an interest. I am the lead for planning of the planning portfolio on Haven Borough Council. And um, everything I've heard this morning um, aligns very much with my views on this subject. Um, if I may, our local plan has been in action uh, of development for nearly five years. Um, it's gone out for its second set of consultation prior to being submitted to the inspector for the examination in public. Um, at every stage, the consultees have contributed to uh, the development of the local plan and equally where, plan, where sites are coming forward, which are already in the local plan, they also are commenting and offering their considered opinions recognising its opinions, not necessarily uh, facts. Um, in terms of the, uh, the changes that are being proposed, We've got the permitted development changes, we've got the change in the standard method of housing numbers, and we've got this one as well. So we've got three things coming down uh, the tracks that all have uh, different impacts, but collectively recognises a significant change and certainly a reduction in the, uh, the authority of the local planning authorities, because most of it's going to be done almost by default and by legislation rather than by consideration of the local planning authority. So when you look at things such as growth, renewal and protected, because that has already been announced by central government, those lobbying bodies out there who are keen to protect what they believe is sites in their local area, I'm not allowed to call them NIMBYs because apparently that's not being very kind, um, have already designated their areas of interest as protect, irrespective of whether that's an, an accurate assessment or not. That's their perception of their, their particular area. So that creates us a problem moving down. Um, we talk about... Um, duty to cooperate, I think that's really significant in terms of how we can move forward, particularly across Hampshire, where there is a, you know, the, um, the partnership for rural and southern Hampshire. That's a key uh, component of taking this uh, forward. Um, we talk about neutr neutrality, particularly in the SPAs, and there's a really big issue down here in Haven uh, because of our two harbours, Chichester and Langston, and we've brought in a mitigation scheme for that that we've developed locally here. And the challenge has always been, and nobody will answer the question, we have to demonstrate there is not a significant effect. But nobody will give me a definition of what significant means in that context. It's not there. You, we have to demonstrate that essentially one house could have significant effect, but 
that's not quantified either by science um, or fact. So that creates a problem for us. But we've overcome that now. And we think we have a solution. So now for the next five years. And in terms of, I think as Councillor Simpson said, you know, I think altogether there's about 500,000 houses have been approved in a planning application terms across England. They have not been built out. You know, so it's not as if you know, the authorities are slowing the process down. And I honestly believe there is an element of land banking. We have a, a, the Winchester City Council um, major development area, which is very close to my division here. Um, it's been building since 1998, and it's not expected to finish until 2031, 2,600 homes. So, you know, our local plan, we have the Southley um, uh, extension, 2,100 homes. But we reckon between now and 2037, at best, we'll, we'll build a thousand of them. So I don't necessarily believe it's the appro approvals process that is slowing the, develop uh, the building of those properties. I actually believe it's the developers themselves who are very conscious of supply and demand. And if there's a greater supply, a uh, greater demand than there's supply, they can keep their house price is high and they, they get more of their money. In terms of infrastructure, my last point, in terms of infrastructure, what they propose is essentially what they do in France. In France, the local mayor will take an area and say, right, this is where I want to house it, and he'll put in all the infrastructure. The developers then come along, they build the houses, once the houses have been built and been sold, they pay the local mayor for the installation of the infrastructure. So I think they're trying to work that through, but I'm not necessarily sure that's the correct way of going. So there's lots of things to come forward, and I'd be very interested to see what the government response is to not just this consultation, but the one on the standard method and on the permitted developments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Um, I'll go to Councillor Todd next and then ask Chris to sum up. Um, Councillor Todd. I've got, a, I've got a few comments and a question or two. Um, first thought, I mean, as people have talked about the duty to cooperate, what the paper seems to miss is the idea that the infrastructure is often linked to development. And maybe that linkage is an important point. If I think of the King's Barton development in Winchester, you know, there is off-site infrastructure which actually the developer needs as well as uh, as well as us as a community in order for the development to work and it seems really weird where there's a sort of unring fence handing over of money i think mean, there's a point maybe that it doesn't actually work in the interest of developers either if there's no clear linkage between off-site infrastructure changes and the development in itself and i know in some cases they actually have the ability to reclaim the money if we don't spend it so it seems odd. Uh, tapping into the other points that people have made, the cross-border point is really important, um, certainly if the funding is going to districts. At one point, Eastleigh, although it is no longer, was looking at developing very near the Winchester border. And in order for development to work, the road had to go through the Winchester district, and that road had to be paid for. And it's extremely unclear what the mechanism is whereby Eastleigh would build a road in the Winchester district or, I mean, that sounds wrong, you know, how would that road get built is, is an interesting question. It's not on land owned by the potential developer. Um, so it's this linked infrastructure idea that I think we need to push on. If there was one area that I thought might need building up in our response, I think there is the point about the climate emergency and zero carbon. It's an absolute priority for us. We need to see it reflected in the design codes. We need changes in the planning process. I mean, I live in a grade two listed building so that we don't have idiotic, you know, we can we can actually do more on all types of housing on environmental standards. But also that ties into our, our need for active travel. I was in a meeting the other day where one of our local public transport um, providers was scathing on the subject of what this would mean for bus infrastructure, um, you know, other things like park and ride infrastructure, off-site improvements, there's a whole bunch of things that need to be put in place. And the way that sites are connected into uh, the rest of the community, and that can't be done as just a handover of money. It needs to be part of the scheme as a whole, and that development has to happen as part of the scheme as a whole. So I think we need to pull that out. That also ties into questions, other areas, which are just not covered. Um, so it's I don't understand how this system looks at employment land, for example, and identifying the right level of employment land. I don't understand how it protects green space. And one very important area, uh, you know, a particularly vulnerable part of our community, but gypsy and traveller sites, how will they get allocated? How do they fit into this 
uh, process and scheme, uh, a very important part of planning. Um, and then a final thought on the on the um, on the, uh, the the payment of, of money. Uh, just two thoughts that may be worth making. The first point is land value increases on the grant of planning permission. It doesn't increase on the value of sale. As soon as planning permission is granted, the value of the land goes up the next day. Uh, it, it, the building doesn't actually affect the value of the land. It affects the land and the building together. And then there's, I suppose, there's a question as to how the money comes in, because presumably it's do, when they say on occupation, does that mean that we get a bit of money when they sell house number one and a bit of money when they sell house number two and a bit of money when they sell house number three. And I suppose the issue we have there is if we don't know the timing of the money, how can we borrow? Because if you don't know when your money's coming in and how you repay, how does that work? I think uh, it's even worse. I think it's worse than that. I think the government will take the money and we'll then have to apply for it and we've got no certainty that we're going to get it back. It might go to the north. Um, so, yeah, thank you for all that. Have you finished, Councillor Thomas? Um, I think, let me just quickly check. I think, yeah, so I think we've talked about transport infrastructure, public transport infrastructure, talked about land value increases and talked about gaps. And I think talked about maybe a section of our response that looks through the lens of our climate emergency and yeah. zero carbon objectives. I think that's a good point, well made. Um, Chris, can I just invite you to respond to any of uh, those comments that you feel you would like to respond to, please? Thank you, Chairman. Well, firstly, thank you for those comments. I think they will be very useful in, in helping us put together our response, so well, thank you for that. Um, I think on the climate change uh, area, I think Councillor Todd is right, there's, there's very uh, limited reference. There is talk about a new uh, carbon zero strategy for for, do, for new home building, um, but it, it, there isn't a lot of detail, of course. So I think we need to explore that further. Um, I agree that um, it's very much housing focused the whole consultation, so very little about uh, employment, is, uh, and I think that is something that we need we need to raise. Um, so a number of issues that I've made a note of, of the comments that members have been making and that we will be incorporating those in, into our response. The consultation period closes on the 29th of October, so we will be, as I said earlier, preparing a response for the leader and deputy leader to, to sign off before, before we send that, that out. Um, so again, Chairman, thank you for your comments today. Thank you, Chris. Um, can I go to Councillor Humby for his uh, thoughts on this issue, please? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. And again, thank you to Chris for uh, his presentation. Um, I'll be just very quick. I was in very interested. I think really Councillor Philpott summed up the, the two main concerns that I had, and that's come up several times, was the 30 months on the timescale. Understand the ambition of trying to simplify it, of trying to work within that timescale. The amount of work, I mean, we have 13 sections within the ETE department that has to go through this process, and that is really very challenging, or it would be to do that. And also, many of you have raised about the developers' contributions and occupancy. That is a great concern to us, and that has been raised, as I say, several times as well. So you've heard Chris say he's noted all those points. So have I, and I'll be having those discussions with Stuart Jarvis as well and with the leader, and look forward to your letter, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we've covered everything. There's just there's a, another couple of points I wanted to make before I sum up. Firstly, I've got a particular concern about people who live in the fringes of our national parks and AOMBs, who I think are going to have a real problem in in those communities. They're going to they're going to face pressure because of the way the numbers are going to be allocated, and that's going to have impact on them, but also on the national park. And I think that's a point that we need to make, because if you think about it, it's quite a lot of people who live within 10 miles of a designated area. Um, and then I think we could also call for Hampshire County Council to have a, more of a role in master planning for the county. Um, do, does anyone agree with me on that? I mean, that's just my view that, you know, given Hampshire's unique status with with its uh, mixture of communities, urban and rural, some national parks, um, a county-wide view is is needed. 
anyone wish to disagree with me on that though? Um, okay, well, may, maybe I can include that point. But the, the letter I send, I'm not going to write a very long letter, but I will say that firstly, the committee thinks that Hampshire should Hampshire County Council, in our response, we should be robust in setting out concerns about infrastructure spending. And uh, the levy may well not be in anyone's interest, developers or communities or county. Um, and, you know, we, we should be as robust as possible in setting out our concerns about that. Um, certainly, I will mention that we're concerned about the 30 months um, stipulation that it's an oversimplification and a blunt instrument. Um, I will say we're concerned about affordable housing and the threshold being reduced. Uh, concerned about land banking, and there doesn't seem to be anything in the in the white paper that will tackle that. Uh, I will also set out our concerns about the climate emergency not being properly reflected or the, in, in the design codes and in the overall system. Um, has anyone uh, got any particular desire to flag up anything that I may have missed in summing up there? Uh, Councillor Philpott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. You asked specifically the question there, uh, I think, of, uh, of members of the committee, uh, whether you think Hampshire have a role to play in, in being more strategically involved, and I think they do, and I completely agree with your analysis on that. Uh, I would point out that uh, to Councillor Grayeski uh, and uh, Stuart Jarvis sit on the Partnership for South Hampshire uh, uh, committee, uh, joint committee, and they play a very active role in, in that. And, uh, and not only is, uh, is that well represented, not just by Hampshire County Council and officer and, and, and member level, but of course all of the district councils across South Hampshire join that too. And I might say the, the Solent Left. So I think it's of those sorts of forums are very important ways in which the county can uh, use their influence and uh, and do exactly as you suggested. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Councillor Todd. You're on mute, Martin. I think the point has been uh, captured by Mr Murray, but we did touch on some other areas like employment, land, gypsy and traveller sites. I think I, which I'm fairly confident is going to follow through on anyway. But I think the, uh, the, uh, the overarching point about a strategic role is right. I think it will be important maybe not to define that too broadly and be clear what we have in mind. You know, what are the cross-cutting issues that we need to take a wider view of? Yeah. Thank you. And Councillor Curl, I, I did, uh, I did uh, think about your point about the lack of democracy. And I wonder if that's what you're going to suggest that we need to think about. Um, well, I mean, there is that point. Thank you, Chair. I wasn't actually necessarily going to bring that up, but I, I do think that, you know, we do need to make sure that actually our communities do need to be consulted as indeed it needs to be wider. There needs to be wider consultation. We need to not forget that we are in a democracy and that we shouldn't just be led by a, a centralist government uh, dictate to just basically deliver more homes, which I do think, as I said before, I think developers do need to play a uh, more responsible role, if I may put it that way. I'm, I'm not sure how diplomatic I could be on that. Um, but what I did, what, there was one point which hasn't been mentioned really, and I do think that um, it is quite difficult, obviously, clearly, but I think that also needs to be mentioned that when you're looking at a wide, wider planning sense or even a local sense, in effect, that utility companies need to also be included in this to make sure that their utility plans uh, are actually also running, shall we say, in tandem with uh, expectation of delivery of homes uh, and the utilities in effect that they are needed or be, will be required. And I'm talking specifically about sewerage infrastructure, et cetera. Quite often we're seeing developments coming forward now uh, where there has to be, as it were, independent sewage um, works, shall we say, uh, to, ser to service those developments because the, uh, the, the bigger uh, companies in effect uh, don't have it within their five or 10 year plans and therefore the development in effect comes forward with a standalone, um, uh, shall we say, utility service like sewerage or whatever, et cetera, um, which obviously puts more vehicles on the roads as well. So clearly that's not particularly sustainable either. So I think there's a there's something that ought to be in the white paper about if we are delivering more homes, there has got to be more growth. We do need to look actually at a wider 
um, substructure, if you like, uh, or infrastructure for utility companies, and they should be encouraged, if you like, to work closer with local authorities uh, and the government, in effect, to make sure that, that utilities, those utilities are fit for purpose and, and are available. Yeah, Thank and you. broadband, uh, of course, is a utility, and there could be something yep. about that. Um, well, thank you, members. I think that's been a really good discussion and um, I've got plenty to write down. Um, and uh, yeah, wider environmental issues certainly do come into it and I will pick that up. Um, I sit on a National Park Authority and I, I'm just extremely concerned about what the uh, plans are going to mean for the National Park if we get an enormous building. And I know the, the New Forest has a very similar problem uh, around its fringe. Um, but it's, it's wider than that. It's about the entire countryside and the character of Hampshire. Um, and it also relates back to the, all of the issues we were discussing earlier in the meeting about how people get around. Um, so I will do that and I'll copy my letter to the committee. Um, and uh, that, that's, uh, I think, the end of that item. Thank you, members. And the final item on our agenda is item. To, uh, sorry, I just wanted finally also to thank Chris for your presentation and for all your help. Um, our final item is item 10, the work program. And uh, if anybody would like to comment on the work program, please do so now. We have quite a full agenda for January because we've also now requested um, the scrutiny of the of the proposals on school streets, but we also have pre-scrutiny of budget, uh, as we always do in January. So I think we're going to have quite a full meeting. Um, but if any member wishes to um, give us any comments on the work programme, please email me, copy to Katie. So if everyone's happy with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank Councillor Humby and Stuart Jarvis for attending. And uh, I'd like to thank Katie for organising us all. And uh, I will look forward to speaking to you all soon and being in touch. And uh, our next meeting will be 15th of January. Thank you very much, members. Thanks. And